Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take my mind and think through it. Take my heart and set it on fire for the love of you. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. It's so great to see you all and some old new friends, new old friends. I don't know how to say that. This morning's gospel message is a double feature. You remember double features, don't you? you? You go to the movie, and you get to see two movies for the price of one. Now, there's always an intermission in between where you could go to the lobby, get your popcorn or thin mints or whatever you had, whatever you liked and had a quarter for. <laughs> Boy, those days are long gone, aren't they? <laughs> the movies were cheaper and shorter and not as loud. Today's theme seems to be about doing any work on the Sabbath. The Jewish Sabbath starts on sunset of Friday evening and ends after dark on Saturday evening. Saturday being the seventh day back in those days. Of course, with us today, Sunday is always the Sabbath. The Jews were not to do any work from sunset Friday all day Saturday. It was the Hebrew law. No working or traveling. Now that was just one of the many laws that were observed. And our Sabbath on Sunday is our church day. Maybe it's a family day, or a Luby's day, or an IHOP day. When I was a kid, back in the Victorian age, most everything was closed on Sunday. No stores, no bars, lots of restaurants. In the Jewish tradition, God's work of creation culminated not with the creation of humanity on day six, but with the creation of rest on the seventh day. A rabbi describes that interpretation this way. After the six days of creation, what did the universe still lack? Rest. Came the Sabbath, and the universe was complete. Now, rest is not merely an absence of something like work or busyness, doing of all kinds. Rest is something real and intrinsically positive. This must have been the view of the ancient rabbis if they believed that it took a special act of creation to bring it into being, that the universe would be incomplete without it. What was created on the seventh day? Tranquility, serenity, peace, and repose. Tranquility, serenity, peace, and repose. A hallowed day to turn our hearts to God. An opportunity to share in the divine love of peace and love. An opportunity intended for all. But I expect that many of us, the idea of Sabbath feels remote from the reality of Sundays that are filled to the overflowing with leisure activities and the undone tasks of a never-ending work week. In response, I invite us to begin to bridge that gap by inviting a Sabbath sensuality into our daily lives by participating regularly in the delight that marked God's own response to a creation wonderfully made. I suggest, just as a starting point, that we incorporate Sabbath moments of praise and thanksgiving into our daily routines, not to replace the day of complete rest that was intended for the Sabbath, but to begin to shift our lives in a Sabbath direction. One kind of Sabbath moment that I've been practicing lately is to step outside in the morning with the heat and the humidity, first thing, and listen and look and breathe and offer a brief prayer of thanks and praise. It's a lovely way to start the day. What might a practice of Sabbath moments look like in your life? Today's feature one. When Jesus and his disciples were going through the grain field, they began to pick some grain to eat. Apparently, they were hungry, but that's like eating raw oatmeal. 
The Pharisees seemed to be present everywhere and saw them doing this. They were criticized for this work and said it was unlawful on the Sabbath. When Jesus walked the dusty streets of Galilee and Judea, we have evidence in Scripture that he observed a Jewish calendar, which would have included the Sabbath. Often his actions on the Sabbath and the parables he told went to the heart of the concept of Sabbath, as put forth by God in the beginning. A number of times he healed people on the Sabbath, and his disciples were caught plucking grain to eat on the Sabbath. Jesus seemed more concerned with the spirit of the law and why God had commanded us to observe the Sabbath in the first place. Certainly, he wasn't the only one focused on the heart of the matter, but we're fortunate to have the recorded Gospels that give us the examples of Jesus. He would have been familiar with Isaiah's prophetic vision of the Sabbath, joyful, acceptable to God, a time of prayer. Now, I know that we all try to follow the word of the law. We may have had a run-in or two, but hopefully nothing serious. Well, I got arrested once for my fraternity brothers taking a gumball machine from an airport at college and putting it in the trunk of my car. I was asked to come to the police station and grilled to confess who the culprits were. It was a scene out of Starkey and Hutch. I held my ground, and didn't confess the names, but I did have to pay for the stolen goods. And I hope the statute of limitations has expunged my record by now. <laughs> but sometimes there are so many laws that we don't know that we are actually breaking them. Ever made a rolling stop at a stop sign? Now, these two stories in the Gospel of Mark, one in the grain fields and one in a synagogue, are very important for us to understand Mark as a whole. They show us why some of Jesus' peers found him offensive to the degree that they felt he was a danger to them. These scenes play a crucial role in setting the stage for many sermons to come. But back to the first feature. The disciples aren't just traveling through the grain fields. They really aren't stealing, but they're eating the oats. What concerns the Pharisees is that they're walking and pulling off the grain on the Sabbath. They should have stayed put and prepared food to eat the day before like the good Jews did. They confront Jesus, and he disagrees. He doesn't think that it's okay to disobey the Sabbath rule, but because he regards Sabbath in a different light. He tells about how David ate the grain, ate the bread on the altar that was for the priests. Jesus says it's okay what his guys did. He says that sometimes certain rules are okay to bend in favor of meeting greater needs like a person's hunger. After all, he knows that his father instituted the Sabbath so the people who toiled in slavery can forever enjoy at least one day of rest. Even God rested on the seventh day, right? He says the Sabbath is handed over to you, not you to it. The proper function of the Sabbath is to promote life, make it a bit easier, and then to praise God. Now, the second feature of this doubleheader just adds to the fervor of the conflict over Jesus' authority, his values, and his claims. The Pharisees, who still seem to watch his every move, don't think the issue is whether Jesus has the power to heal a man's hand. It's whether doing so on the Sabbath shows a disregard for their laws. The sixth of the Ten Commandments says to rest on the seventh day and keep it holy. Doesn't really say how much to rest or how much to cook or what time to go out for brunch. No, it just says to rest and keep it holy. Jesus responds to the Pharisees. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save life or to kill? shows he disagrees with the idea of their suspicion. 
by fixing the man's hand. He does not break the law in any way, for nothing Jesus does can really be considered work, does it? More so, it shows Jesus as honoring the purpose of the Sabbath commandment. It's as if Jesus is saying that the chief objective of the law in general is to save and preserve life. Indeed, what better day is there than the Sabbath? A day meant to promote God's commitment to humanity as the restoration of a man's crooked hand. Admittedly, the man was not dying, but his hand was withered. Jesus' determination shows the urgency of his life-giving work. Without the restoration of his hand, the man could not have his ability to work. In receiving that healing, he may recover his ability to provide for his family. In other words, we need to avoid seeing the miracle in a vein as an act of merely fixing something that had gone wrong with the man. It means to promote life and human dignity. In this pair of movie scenes, this double feature, Jesus does not fight Judaism. He does not even call the Pharisees blind guides. A sermon should not do those things either. But a sermon should show the way to a commitment to life and the love of God's words. In many ways, the whole gospel of Mark tells us stories of recurring controversy. He wants us to interpret the controversies and be reminded how easily the best motives can get turned around. The gospel records several occasions when Jesus performed a healing on the Sabbath. And usually right after there was a big confrontation with the religious leaders. I think it's important for us to remember that Jesus was not violating the law when he healed. He was, yes, acting against the pharisaical interpretation of the law and rules. The basic reason Jesus healed on the Sabbath was that people needed his help. Need, no, need knows no calendar, does it? The Jews worked on the Sabbath by taking care of their animals, and that work was sanctioned by the Pharisees. Care of one animals was an everyday event. They don't know what day it is. Jesus says that if the law allows helping animals on the Sabbath, then it should definitely allow for helping people. I really love the idea that Jesus confronted the Pharisees with a challenge now, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? That stumped the leaders, and they remained silent. I looked into what the law in question really was, according to the Pharisees. It restricted writing, erasing, tearing, conducting business, shopping, cooking, baking, or kindling a fire, gardening, doing laundry, carrying anything for more than six feet in a public area, moving anything with our hand, even with a broom, a broken bowl, flowers, candles, raw food, rocks, a button that has fallen off. Seems you could move things with your elbow or your breath, but not your hand. And the list goes on. Think about comparing the Pharisees list with the original order from God. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. It was simply man-made traditions that defined Jesus' healing as work. So when Jesus healed on the Sabbath, he was challenging the Pharisees' beliefs as being from man and not from God. Today, our norms of society don't really tell us what we can and can't do on our Sabbath. The good Lord gave us free will, didn't he? So my wish for all of you today, this Sabbath, and every day, is may his peace surround you. May his arms enfold you. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Deacon Warren. What a blessing to have you with us and sharing. And uh, you've enabled me to have more of a restful Sabbath by you preaching. So I really appreciate that. Thanks a lot. So let's now all stand and confess our faith together in the Nicene Creed.